Hi, I'm Scott Stewart. In this program, we're going to be discussing the art and technique of paint rotoscoping, or 2D painting. There are basically three different kinds of 2D painting. That is plate restoration, uh, photoreal painting, or invisible painting, as I like to call it, and effects animation. We refer to both uh, matte creation uh, by, uh, by hand and uh, 2D painting as rotoscoping. Uh, rotoscope artists generally do both paint and matte creation. Generally speaking, when, when we refer to paint process, we call it 2D painting. You may hear that referred to as rotoscoping. It's basically both processes are a frame-by-frame -frame process, but they are fundamentally different. Uh, one is, is, a, is a matte creation process and is used in a composite. The other is actually literally painting on the photographic image. Let's look at these three different kinds of paint processes a little more closely. When there is an undesirable element in a shot, um, say for example a wire or a rig, a, a boom mic that drops into frame, um, and if there is no procedural way to remove that element, say for example by uh, removing it in the composite, then a rotoscope artist, a 2D paint artist, needs to, to uh, come in and paint out that object on every single frame. Um, so this is why we call it photoreal painting or invisible painting because the object of the game here is to make the work invisible to the eye. You're going to spend lots of hours doing this stuff and of course the result is that no one ever knew that you did anything, hopefully. If no one ever knew any, that you did anything then, then you've done a good job. In recent years Hollywood has uh, found a large audience for the re-release of classic uh, films restored to their original luster. Um, in order for you to be able to go to a movie theater and see these old films uh, looking uh, so pristine uh, required, in some cases, thousands of hours by rotoscope artists removing scratches and dirt and evidence of decay over the years. This is called plate restoration, uh, and this is one of the, the principal aspects of 2D paint. Nearly every film that contains a digital effect shot has uh, this kind of plate restoration in it. It's not just classic pictures. Um, when a film has a digital effect, uh, the, the film is scanned into the computer, um, and then a, a group of dirt removal artists go through frame by frame and check to make sure that there are no dust hits or scratches uh, or, or any kind of damage to the picture before effects work is done. Um, so. It's not just classic pictures that require this kind of work. And in our industry, that's generally known as dust busting. Effects animation is a term used to describe hand-painted visual effects. Those are, for example, electricity, sparks, or lightning. They're often created this way. And effects animation, as we'll see later, has a long history in the movies. A note about effects animation, usually roto artists don't do effects animation. Um, it's a pretty specialized skill. Roto artists generally focus on uh, doing plate restoration and photoreal painting. Um, it's usually 2D animators that will do effects animation. Um, and, and for the sake of this discussion here, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss uh, effects animation a bit. Uh, but we're going to really focus a lot on plate restoration and uh, uh, photoreal painting. The rotoscope camera was mounted a few feet above a flat workspace with the lens pointing straight down. The camera itself could operate as either a camera or a projector. Working on clear animation cells that are held in place by registration pegs, roto artists would paint an element over the image projected down from the camera. After each frame was painted, the cell was replaced with a new one. This was repeated frame by frame until the desired element, lightning for example, had been painted on each frame in a shot. The cells were then photographed in order, frame by frame, and the resultant film was optically composite with the original image using an optical printer. 2D painting is a very difficult and time-consuming process, uh, particularly in the area of photoreal painting and uh, plate restoration. It should only be used as a last resort if procedural solutions just will not work. Um, if that is the case, then a rotoscope artist is called in and can often, with great paintwork, save the day. What makes photoreal painting so difficult? Say, for example, you have a three-second wire removal shot for a film. Um, 
the wire moves through the shot and uh, you need to remove it. Well, if you have to paint that by hand, remember that's 24 frames per second, three seconds, so you've got 72 frames where you need to remove that wire. Well, it's easy enough uh, through some techniques that we're going to discuss later to remove that wire on one frame so you can look at one photographic plate and see that the wire is not there and everything looks normal. But what about the next one? So then you're going to have to remove it again and again and again and again until 72 frames later you see no wire in the shot. But what have you replaced that wire with? Okay, well you had to borrow something from the shot in order to do that. And the trick is to make that something that you replace the wire with move consistently in the wire's absence, right? This is the challenge of, of photoreal painting, is how do you make the paint look consistent over time? It's not so vitally important that you, that you paint back in what was actually there behind, say, for example, the wire that we were talking about. What, what's most important is that you recreate something that moves consistently through the shot so that it looks realistic, photorealistic as we call it, um, and that the audience won't notice that there was a wire there to begin with. Um, what happens if you don't? Well, what happens is you get what's called paint chatter, which is an inconsistent motion to the paint itself as it moves through the shot. Uh, and we can look at some examples of paint chatter. There are a number of things uh, that you can encounter in your shot that will make the paintwork much more difficult. Uh, these are, for example, smoke or uh, an underwater shot or a, a varied exposure. Really anything that makes each frame very, very different from another, uh, so it becomes difficult to find anything that uh, uh, you can use to cover up, say, for example, or paint out a wire. Um, consistently over the course of a shot. It makes it difficult to integrate your paint over time. For example, in, in this shot, uh, you can see a tricycle um, is, is moving through a pool uh, and suspended by wires. Now you can see all the little bubbles in the water, uh, lots of different variations. How are you going to you going to keep the paint consistent over the course of the shot when each frame has these 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 different variations, the bubbles and the um, all these different things that are going to make it very difficult for you to borrow from one other aspect of the, one other region of the shot and cover up those wires? Um, and that's the process that we'll talk about later, where you're actually stealing from one part of the fr the frame in order to cover up something in another part of the frame. Um, you have to really be able to lock that stuff down, and we're going to talk about how to do that in a little bit. Um, also, you can see here is the hair that's moving through the shot. That, that is even more difficult to deal with, um, and we'll talk about how we can do those kinds of things as well. There are a number of different software packages to do 2D painting on the market. Um, they uh, all have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, every artist has their own preference. Um, the tools vary slightly from, uh, from tool to tool. Uh, the important thing here is we're going to talk about generally um, how you use uh, paint brushes and, and painting techniques within any number of these different tools. Let's go over the, uh, the sort of basic brushes that you'll find in most paint packages. Um, the first would be a solid color brush. That is a brush that, uh, that paints with a solid color, say red, blue, green, whatever you pick from a color palette. Um, we don't use these kinds of brushes very often. In fact, uh, it's extremely rare that we would use these kinds of brushes in a photoreal paint or a plate restoration job. Uh, much more likely you would use these in an effects animation capacity. Say, for example, if you were making uh, blue electricity, you would paint that with a solid color brush. Next kind of brush that we, we do use quite often is a blur brush. And this is a kind of brush that you create um, that allows you to soften the edges of paint and blur certain areas, um, try to recreate uh, the kind of blur that you might have in a shot um, by changing uh, focal length or um, something moving very quickly or uh, something uh, um, sort of far in the distance and out of focus. By the way, many 
2 D paint packages allow you to customize your brushes. Um, each package lets you do it a little differently. Uh, it's important to note, though, um, that you can uh, vary the size of the brush, vary the opacity, vary the uh, amount of feather or blur on the edge of a particular brush. And usually this is applicable to, to any different kind of brush, whether it is a solid color brush, a, a blur brush, um, a, a, a darken, a lighten, a dodge, a burn, any of the brushes that we've talked about. Generally speaking, you can customize those. The dodge and burn light and darken tools, um, I group those together. Those are tools that um, mimic uh, the way that you would uh, work in a photographic lab um, when you're exposing a print. Um, essentially what they do is they allow you to lighten or, or selectively lighten or darken particular areas of your image. And we'll use these quite often um, in order to try to bring down the, uh, say for example, a, a varied exposure and try to match an exposure of a particular uh, a bit of paintwork into a plate. The last kind of brush we're going to talk about, and it's the very most important brush for the 2D paint artist, is the clone brush. Most paint packages have some kind of clone brush. Basically what a clone brush does, as its name suggests, it allows you to uh, take uh, a particular part of an image and clone it or duplicate it and put it over another part of the image. So that's how we borrow from a part of a plate to paint out something. For example, a wire or a microphone or uh, a rig. We use the clone brush most of the time. Uh, this is the, is the principal tool of our job. Besides a good 2D paint package, it's important for the 2D paint artist to have a uh, good way to interface with the program itself. And that generally means having a paint tablet and pen. Um, there are a number of, uh, of, of tablets available. Um, this gives you a lot more sort of creative flexibility and power when interfacing with the package. Um, for example, your brushes can have a pressure sensitivity. Um, some applications even recognize the ability to turn the pen over and erase. Um, others um, recognize the angle and velocity of, of your stroke in order to give you a more dynamic or fluid or artistic stroke. Now let's look at photoreal painting or invisible painting. Basically that's a process of trying to see what is behind uh, an element that you want to remove from a shot, say for example a wire. We're trying to remove a wire. We need to be able to see what is behind that wire. Um, as I mentioned before, it's not vitally important that you actually recreate what was there. Just the semblance of something that doesn't distract the audience, that looks real, that um, a appears to move consistently through the shot. This way of seeing behind uh, an element that we're trying to remove, in this example, we're going to be talking about removing a wire from a shot. Uh, Basically, it's a, it's a good time to introduce the concept of clean plate. Now, what is a clean plate? Clean plate is what, we, what uh, we refer to is the frame that you have, or the series of frames, that does not have the, the element that you don't want in the shot in it. In other words, um, a, a version of this plate that doesn't have a wire in it. Now, uh, most of the time, we have to create these clean plates by hand. When we're told that we have a difficult paint shot to do and that uh, there has been a clean plate shot on location, um, oftentimes we, we act with some derision there at that statement because usually the clean plate is, is pretty much worthless. Very rarely is clean plate really clean. Um, and you can see in this example, uh, this is a, an example of a clean plate, typical, that we would get um, wherein uh, it's actually not clean. You've got some black tubatine in the shot. Um, there are things here that don't really make it clean, which is going to make it difficult, if not totally worthless, to use as a clean plate to paint out uh, elements from the shot. Now, if this were a good clean plate, it, it would not have any of the production elements in it, for example, the, the green screen or the black duvetine. Having a clean plate that was shot on location is very, very useful for the 2D paint artist, but only if it's done uh, correctly. Uh, here are a few things that you can keep in mind when shooting a clean plate on location. Make sure that the camera angle is the same as the one for the shot that you're doing the paintwork on. This might be obvious, but you'd be amazed at how often a clean plate gets delivered that's from a completely different angle. 
Also, make sure that the exposure is the same. This will help you avoid having to do difficult color correction later. Sometimes the exposures are so different uh, because maybe the clean plate was shot uh, quite a bit later than the original shot that you can't use it at all. The other thing to keep in mind is that the camera doesn't move um, during the shooting in the clean plate, unless you're just going to use a single frame. Um, don't move the camera around. Uh, it's not going to be very, very helpful, unless, of course, it's a motion control shoot. Much more likely than getting a clean plate shot from location, uh, the 2D paint artist must create a clean plate by hand. Um, what's important there is to, is to try to find a frame that's going to give you the, the, the most uh, coverage so that you can have the, the most information available to you to paint out the element that you are trying to remove. Um, so it's important to look through the entire shot, see if you have um, something that's passing through frame, try to find the frame where the element is not there, um, or try to find a frame that the element is there that you can remove it from, but keep it consistent over the course of the shot. What a clean plate does is it's going to be your, your one hero frame for which it's going to define what the background looks like, for example, um, with a wire removal. If we're removing the wire, uh, what we want to have is we want to have one frame where the wire is gone. There's no wire in the shot. Now, that might have to be created by hand. Very likely it will be. Um, but that's going to be the frame that we're going to use to paint the wire out on every other frame. So now that we have our clean plate, how are we going to use it to remove the wires in this shot? Well, what the clean plate does for us is it gives us uh, the information that is behind those wires on any given frame. We'll take that clean plate and as we, we move through and step through the shot and paint out our wire, we're going to have to move that clean plate as the camera itself moves. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have one still frame, which is our clean plate, and as the camera moves and the wire moves, we're going to move our clean plate with the camera movement, and we're going to line it up on every single frame. And that way, as we line up the shot, we can then paint the wire out. And what this is essentially doing is locking down the paint to each and every frame. That's the important thing. Remember, keep it consistent. You got to make sure that if you're replacing something where that wire is, that you've got to replace it with the same thing, relatively speaking, all the way through the shot as it moves the way it would realistically if there was no wire there in the first place. So this is what the clean plate's doing for us, and this is how we will remove the wires in this shot. So if we use one frame, a still frame, all the way through to remove something in the shot, then what are we doing about the fact that we're actually freezing the grain? You'll notice as we look at the shot again, film has a moving grain. That's a quality of the exposure and the emulsion process, and the chemical process that exposes the film. That's something that we'll notice if we stop it. So the important thing is here is how do we keep that grain moving? Now there are a few different ways. One is to create a clean plate that is actually cycling clean plate, which is uh, a few uh, frames in succession that are clean that have grain moving. The other thing uh, that we can do is uh, we can use previous frames. What we can have is our clean plate that's kind of a moving target, essentially. What that means is perhaps what we're doing is we're just borrowing from a few frames, say, in the past. That way, as we keep stepping through the shot, by being more than just one or two frames in the past, we're going to get the difference of grain. The grain's going to keep moving through since we're not using the same frame over and over again. The eye won't notice a pattern that's being created here. We won't be able to tell, uh, particularly when you're doing something like removing a wire, which is usually pretty thin. Another approach we can take is to post-process the paint. What do I mean by that? Which is sometimes you can only use one frame. Uh, you can only use a one-frame clean plate because if you go back in time, 
um, say four or five frames, you're, you're still going to create too much motion, too much aberration. You're going to be able to notice things are changing too much in the plate. So you use one frame, one clean plate. What you need to do there is you need to add grain back in later. And that's a post process. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, how uh, digital images are put together. The color information from uh, the images that we work on uh, are broken down into four channels the three color channels, which are red, green, and blue, and a fourth channel, which is called the alpha channel, or a matte channel. Now, for more detailed information, I urge you to look at Forrest Key's program on digital images. So what does this mean to us? Well, having an alpha channel provides us with a powerful tool uh, to post-process the paint that we're doing. We're normally always painting RGB, red, green, blue. So the images that you see on the screen that we're cloning from one frame to another, for example, those are, are, are stored in the RGB channels. There is an additional channel, the alpha channel. And if we stroke that channel, we'll be stroking it with uh, just a solid white stroke that represents the, the paint stroke in RGB. Basically, it says, this is what that stroke looks like. Um, that allows us to then post-process that paint stroke. So how's that going to help us? Well, it, what it's going to let us do is add grain and match the grain back into our, our uh, paint strokes that were taken from a still frame. Remember, we're taking it from a clean plate. So that will let us uh, match the grain over the course of the shot and really do a much better job of integrating that clean plate painting uh, into the shot over time. Now that we have our paint strokes with an alpha channel, we can go into our compositing tool and use that alpha channel to isolate those paint strokes so that we can then create grain just within the areas of our paint strokes that match the grain in the background plate. Adding grain to your plate in a post process uh, will really help you integrate uh, the paint that you've done into the shot over time. Remember, the important thing is to make the work invisible to the audience. You don't want to be able to see it. Uh, my, my great joy uh, when I see a shot that I've worked on is if the audience had no idea that I ever did anything to it. All these different we, techniques we've talked about are, are ways that can aid you in locking the paint to the plate, um, using a clean plate, uh, using a clone overlay over time, um, post-processing the paint in order to uh, add grain and make sure the grain matches the, the background plate that it was shot on. Um, all of these things will help integrate your paintwork into the shot, make them look consistent, uh, and make it invisible to the eye. Let's talk about plate restoration. When an effect shot is going to be done, the, the film is, is scanned in to a digital format. Um, they try to take extra special care to make sure that the film is very clean and that it doesn't get damaged in that process. But, but very often, when you actually look at the image as a, a, the film image as a digital image in the computer, you're going to have to go through frame by frame and see where there are dirt hits and, and uh, scratches. Sometimes we encounter those. Um, and have to clean those up, take those out, um, do that dust busting that I talked about earlier uh, in order to prepare these shots for the eventual effects work that will be done. And when we're talking about classic pictures uh, that are being re-released into the theaters, there are thousands of hours of, uh, spent by rotoscope artists painting uh, and restoring these pictures, uh, removing scratches, removing uh, dirt hits, uh, removing tears, um, there's another effect called mottling, which is, a, which is a rot inside the emulsion. Basically looks like you spilled coffee on the film. We have to uh, fix all that stuff in order for the film to look good. So it's a very, very time consuming process. Now, what are some different kinds of things that we can do to try to fix these film images? What are some of the kinds of things that we encounter in a plate restoration? Well. The first thing that we, we generally encounter, uh, even on, on the new pictures that are being scanned in for, for effects work today, 
what we find is uh, dirt. We find a lot of dirt generally. And what does dirt look like? It can look like a few different kinds of things, but you have to scrub through uh, your footage, basically look at frame by frame and try to determine what is a hit of dirt and what is actually supposed to be there. What you don't want to do is, uh, is, is think it's uh, uh, a hit of dirt when actually you're moving the beautiful eye light that was carefully placed by the cinematographer in the actress's eye. So what you'll do is you'll rock back and forth between images and you'll, you'll look through your shot and you'll see if you see this uh, speck of white, this noise that appears in one particular part of the frame um, and, and then flashes off and you don't see it anymore, chances are it's, it's, it's dirt and it's not supposed to be there. So what you'll do is you go in and using a clone brush you will uh, borrow uh, some pixels from an, uh, an area nearby and just dab out that dirt. Another way, another approach you can use, if the, the, the shot is not moving uh, a lot, if it's a, st a stable shot, then it's a, a good idea to borrow from a previous frame. Um, and that is essentially a clone over time. That is, take from one frame and go uh, later or earlier in the frame range and paint with that into another frame. So very often that's a good approach to removing dirt. Fortunately, the dirt is so small that you don't really have to worry about keeping things consistent with dirt. Um, one dab of the color, because it's so small, will probably take it out. You won't really notice it. It goes by so quickly. The next most common thing we find in the plate restoration are scratches. Ooh, it's, they're a real nightmare. Um, there are a few different ways that you can try to remove scratches. Um, it depends on what kind of scratches they are. Tram line scratches, which are, which are really the worst. Tram line scratches are, are the kind of scratch that moves top to bottom through the frame and just sort of moves about and it, and it goes back and forth and just sort of weaves and wobbles over the course of the entire shot. Those are really uh, hard to take out. They're very, very uh, destructive and very obtrusive in the shot particularly if the camera's moving a lot, particularly if there's a, a lot of movement of elements in the shot. It can be very, very, very difficult and very challenging to remove. There are fine scratches, which are mu much more common. Uh, in, in newer films, you would see a fine scratch as opposed to a tramline scratch, hopefully. If the film was handled properly, uh, then you should not see tramline scratches. Um, in older films, classic restorations, tramline scratches are very, very common. So the issue here is, do we use our clone to uh, clone from the same frame, that is, uh, just take something from the side of the scratch, uh, a nearby region, and remove it, push it over, uh, and remove the scratch that way? Or should we offset in time, uh, do a clone over time, offset a frame or two back or forward, and try to uh, take a, a, a bit of the image from an earlier frame and, uh, and, and uh, run it up and down where the scratches, this can be really effective for removing scratches because scratches usually don't stay in the same place for very long. Um, they kind of dance around the screen. Uh, and, and, uh, and so cloning over time actually works quite nicely uh, if the shot isn't moving very much. If it is moving a lot, uh, that's not going to work so well. Um, you're going to probably have to borrow from the same frame. It's a pretty tricky business. Remember, try to keep things consistent. The other tool in our arsenal is, uh, is a wire removal tool. Uh, not all paint packages have these, only some of them do, but uh, it's worth talking about. What you do is you, you use your wire removal to draw a line over the scratch, and then what, it, what the seaming process is, is it will take pixels on either side of that line and seam them together, and essentially fill that scratch up with the color of pixels from uh, the surrounding area in the plate. Um, the result, if done uh, correctly, is you will see over the course of the shot that the scratches just appear to be, to be gone. The problem with this kind of approach is that it can often, particularly if there's a, a, a strong pattern where the scratch is, the wire removal tool will create a, a tearing effect. Uh, and you can take a look at that here, where, where the seaming process is actually creating a sort of aberration that if you were to use this over the course of the entire shot, you would see uh, a strange blurring tear moving where the scratch was, and, and that's not certainly not better. So we've got we've to find a way to remove the scratch without creating the absence of a scratch there moving through the shot.
Yeah. Effects painting really is, uh, is more akin to uh, traditional animation than any of the other techniques that we were talking about, photoreal painting or plate restoration. A real common example would be to show electricity. Um, and often that's a, a good thing to do using effects animation where you'd actually just sort of paint the electricity by hand. Now, uh, an important thing to do there is to have a tool that allows you to do onion skinning. Onion skinning is a technique used by traditional animators, and what it allows you to do is essentially see the previous frames that you painted on as overlays, so that you can keep track of where you're going and where you were. It's a way of seeing backward and forward in time all at once, and, th and that allows you to keep your, 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 your paint effects more consistent. Another tool that is useful in effects animation are, are layers. Some paint programs offer layers, and they can be very helpful. What do layers do for you? Well, layers allow you to separate your work out onto to individual planes so they can be uh, one on top of the other. And that way, um, the work that you do is not destructive and it won't um, destroy the background image. So you can add your electricity um, without actually changing anything about the background plate. You can paint it on. Um, and then what you can do is you can apply various blurs or glows and effects to that paintwork. Uh, which will allow uh, to, you to give it um, an even more dynamic look. Um, so layers can be very, very, very helpful for you in, in, in that respect. Um, it prevents you from destroying the original image and allows you to keep adding more and more and more and then selectively look and see which ones are working and which ones aren't. The other thing that we can do with effects painting, which is, which is very useful, and we talked about it earlier, is painting with an alpha channel. So if you paint RGB and A, you can then take that alpha channel, for example, if we were painting electricity, go into our compositing tool, and then apply effects to the paint that way. And you can perhaps do some more dynamic effects over time in your compositing tool than you could in your individual paint program. For more information on compositing, check out Ron Brinkman's programs, Compositing Concept 1 and 2. So what do you do if you have to remove uh, an element that moves behind, uh, say, a, a, a character in a film? Well, uh, what you can do is you can create a mat around the element that you're trying to remove just as it intersects with the element that you want to keep in the image. Um, what that lets you do there, using a combination of rotoscoping and compositing along with your paint, is constrain the paint just inside the area of that mat or perhaps outside the area of that mat. Um, and your edges are going to stay nice and consistent, and you can be able to, you can tweak that um, in your composite. So uh, this is going to be one way that you can really sort of save time and make that job easier, because it becomes very difficult. You can imagine if you have to paint every frame and try to uh, not destroy the edges of the element that you want to keep in your shot. Another challenge that you'll face when you're painting shots is a varying exposure. Um, this can present you a lot of problems. What if you have flashing lights or, or shadows moving through the shots? Well, this might require you to use a combination of different methods. For example, painting with a clean plate. Um, you're going to have to match grain, most likely. You're also going to have to have an alpha channel um, for your paint strokes, so that what you can then do is go into your compositing environment and do a color correction on your, on your paintwork, but you're going to need to keyframe that, so you're going to need to change it over time. Because remember, your, key, your, your clean plate is a still image, which has one exposure. So if you want to match that over time, you're going to need to do a, a color correction over time within your compositing environment. For more information on how to do color correction, check out Ron Brinkman's programs, Compositing Concepts 1 and 2. In some situations, you might even need to create a series of clean plates. Now, I don't necessarily mean cycling clean plates, but a series of, of clean plates over the course of the shot. Um, and then what you're going to have to do uh, is, is do uh, basically kind of a blend. And you're going to have to do it by hand, perhaps. Um, and that can be 
very, very difficult, but that might be your only solution if things are changing very, very dramatically over the course of the shot and you still need to paint some element out that exists in the frame the entire time. Say, for example, if you have a, a light blinking on and off, uh, you might want to have a series of clean plates, uh, for one for the light on and one for the light off, and that way you can uh, toggle back and forth. Um, that, that is one way that you can approach uh, that kind of situation when you're painting an element from a shot. One of the problems with using multiple clean plates, like uh, using a series of them, say uh, maybe having a new clean plate uh, every 30 frames, uh, I, I've encountered that on shots before. What you then have to do is essentially do a blend um, between them, and that, that can be pretty challenging. That usually requires you to meet somewhere in the middle there and start um, sort of dissolving by hand those, those frames from one clean plate to the next. Um, Obviously, if you can try to find an area that has some sudden difference, it's, it's a pretty good place to jump from one clean plate to the next. If you can't, then you probably have to use varying opacities to your brushes and other different blending techniques, um, blurs and, and various different techniques like that in order to um, sort of bridge the gap between two clean plates. You'll notice that we've been talking a lot about compositing uh, and integrating with 2D paint. There is a sort of blurry line there. Uh, any given shot, is it a composite or is it a 2D paint shot? Chances are it's both. Very often a compositor is going to need a clean plate to be used in a procedural method of comping something in or taking something out of a shot. It's always important to look at the shot first and decide whether you really, really need to do 2D paint frame by frame. If you can find a procedural approach, definitely try to do it. Um, it's only in those situations where a procedural approach won't work that you, you end up turning to 2D paint. One procedural approach is using motion tracking along with a clean plate. What we're doing is if we have, a, say, we're moving an element from a shot, say um, a, a boom mic, um, and the uh, camera is moving, well, what we, we can probably do is we can probably track some element of the shot generate um, the information of how the camera is moving and then apply that movement to the clean plate. For more information on motion tracking, check out Stu Mashwitz's program on the subject. Now remember, we're also going to have to go into the compositing environment and reintroduce the grain because we're working from a still image. We perhaps might need some rotoscoped mats in order to composite the elements that, for example, would move in front of our clean plate or in front of that boom mic. Um, if the boom mic goes behind any of the actors in the scene, we'll need to composite them back over. So this begs the question, is this a compositing shot or is it a 2D paint shot? Well, the truth of the matter is, is that it's both. And in many cases, you will find that you need to use a number of techniques. <laughs> Another way that we use motion tracking to aid us in our, in our paint work is if the camera is sh shaking a lot and we have um, a lot of changing elements in our shots, um, we might need to stabilize the shot first, then do our paint work, then reintroduce that camera motion to the shot. Um, sometimes it just won't work out that we can just stick a clean plate on there using motion tracking. Um, sometimes we actually need to go in there and do the paint by hand. but. If there's a lot of motion in the plate, it, it, it's, it's probably a better idea to try to stabilize it first if you can um, uh, get away with it. So what is then needed to do is once you reintroduce that motion, um, that is called an inverse stabilization. Motion tracking rounds out the arsenal of tools for the 2D paint artist, along with all of the other techniques and tools that we've discussed in this program. Thanks for watching. If you'd like more information, check out our website. You can email us your questions and we'll get an answer back to you. 2D paint is very difficult and very time-consuming work, but it's really rewarding. So keep at it, and good luck.
check out Stu Mashwitz's program on motion tracking. <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> do it. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. You got it. This is what we did last night. <clears throat> Stop. <laughs> Making some great looking. <laughs> Making some great looking. Great talking to you and uh, have a good time painting. No way! <laughs> Good time painting.